It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Crawford, a Fulbright Scholar from Ireland, who's gonna uh, tell us about uh, movement and activities and exercise, right? Yeah. And an exercise program that has been very successful in Ireland that we want to learn about and bring it to the US, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and practice it. So let's, let's, uh, let's uh, start the, the afternoon session with this, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, everybody. And firstly, can I say, I'm delighted the woman that lost her phone with the baby on it didn't lose the baby. So um, I'm delighted to be here, and it's my very, very, very great pleasure. And thanks to uh, Liz, Elizabeth Torres, and indeed the team here for such a wonderful, wonderful welcome. And today has been equally wonderful because we're all sitting in the collaborative space of movement. And it's very, very much a passion of mine, very close to my heart. And I think it is essential that we all grow this piece together as we're doing right now. And like so many other people who spoke today, I started out in this world, in the world of autism, um, almost by default. I'm a bit of a mixed bag background. I originally trained as a nurse and a midwife and I could identify so much with talk about uh, babies' reflexes, etc. because in another lifetime I was checking those at birth. And um, I evolved into the whole area of sport and exercise science and began working with teams in Ireland, football, hurling teams, one of our national sports, rugby, athletics, etc. And in that time, my only child, Tomás, who was two, was diagnosed as autistic. So I was pulled kicking and screaming into a world I didn't know anything about. And over time then I evolved, of course, like everybody else, to stop trying to fix my beautiful son, but rather to fix myself and realize that I had to grow and learn in the world of autism. And for me, I was very fortunate uh, when I graduated uh, with a BSc in Sport and Exercise Science, ironically enough, Evie mentioned it as well earlier, um, I graduated in 2001, the day 9-11, um, and um, I was very fortunate. The Irish government offered me a scholarship to do my PhD in the area of autism and motor impairment. It was to be the first study in Ireland of its kind. So we went on, number one, to look at how educators felt about accommodating autistic students in movement programs. And of course, needless to remark, we found that they were terrified, unprepared, all the rest of it. And secondly, then we went on to create interventions um, to address motor impairment for autistic students, and they just seemed to take off. So from there, my life evolved for many years, as did Tomas's. And um, I went on to work in University College Cork for many years as a researcher, a lecturer in the School of Education. And more recently, in the last number of years, because the demand became so great, particularly from occupational therapists, physios, and teachers into the sporting world and into parents to come on board and help people develop quality movement programs and equally to look at how skills are developed. So that's where I found myself in the last couple of years. I also work with one of our Science Foundation Ireland Neurological Diseases Research Centres, developing the whole remit of education and public engagement um, around neurological disease in Ireland. So actually, I'm sitting here with two hats that are very, very uh, connected. So I'll take you through some of our journeys. So initially, um, I suppose the Get Out of the Active in uh, initiative was for me around providing, opening up the world of movement for our autistic population. For all the right reasons, I hope, for regulation and all the rest of it, but equally for quality health and quality physical activity gains. Um, I suppose my health piece will always stay with me as well. Um, so just today, and a lot of this has been explored already, so I'll whistle stop through some of it because it's been well covered. 
Um, I'll talk through where I suppose the rationale for the programme, the Get Autism Active programme came from, what the components are of it, etc., and work our way through um, how we build it and how we promote it, etc. Uh, first of all, can I say, and Vikram, you very much spoke of it in your, in your presentation, the whole piece for me and in my time in university um, and my Fulbright scholarship and other awards all came from building connections with community. So I very much come from the ethos of university school community collaborations being of value from day one and working together and the voices of all stakeholders should be informing every single thing we do, particularly our artistic population. I suppose I don't need to preach to the, to the converted here, motor development. I just put in these because they contextualize where I've come from myself with so many others like me, uh, that motor development very much is the study of changes in human motor behavior over the lifespan. And I think this is really important because I have worked with literally preschool providers all the way up to people who are elderly, who are autistic, who hadn't been given opportunity to participate in quality movement programs because of maybe being in institutionalized settings, etc. And we have seen those people's lives transformed and indeed language emerging, um, as Evie and others have highlighted, when given opportunity and ways and means to actually express themselves. Um, so, and the processes that underline these changes and the factors that affect them. Motor learning, we define it as a set of internal processes associated with practice or experience leading to relatively permanent changes in the capability for skill behaviour. And for me, I suppose, I cut my teeth with two very wonderful motor specialists, Professor David Sugden from the University of Leeds and Professor PJ Smith from the University of Limerick, and we spent our time talking about frequency, intensity, and duration of practice, practice, practice. And we've mentioned it so many times here today, and I've seen it again turn programs around for people. Um, and thanks to Liz, I've up updated this definition, which is great. Uh, motor control a complex process involving the coordinated contraction of muscles due to the transmission of impulses sent from the motor cortex to its motor units. And I suppose it's the process of initiating, directing, and grading purposeful voluntary movement. But equally, as my wonderful colleague Liz pointed out, kinesthetic reference, feedback from self-generated movements has been identified as a key aspect of motor control by the work of Liz and other people um, like her. Just to characterize once again, what do we mean by fundamental movement skills? So for us, these are skills of movement of everyday life. And we tend to classify them in the world of um, motor development as locomotor manipulation and balance. Locomotor, I actually thought about doing a quick movement um, exercise here with you all, but I figured it to be very unfair seeing as you have a long day done. Uh, locomotor, anything that involves moving from A to B to C, running, hopping, skipping, uh, jumping. Manipulation is anything that involves an object. Catching, throwing, striking, picking up your cup is a manipulative skill. Balance then, either static or dynamic. Static, I'm standing here, I don't fall down. Dynamic, I haven't fallen once I'm running along the road. Gallahu and Osman have informed a lot of our practice over time. Um, we've gone from uh, the reflexive movement phase all the way across rudimentary to our fundamental movements and into specialised. And I suppose just to say in the context of international literature and international research, we talk about the autistic population indicating or showing delay, delay in fundamental movement skills, but equally lots of our research is showing Delay in fundamental movement skills is very common among primary and secondary school students across the globe. And this is all related back to lack of practice. I suppose what I wanted to just indicate here was fundamental movement skills, we like to see um, the whole piece beginning to emerge at around two to three years of age and then move from initial to elementary to mature. 
but that can take much longer. It can be a different trajectory depending on the work that's being done with groups or with individuals. Why is it all so important? Well, I said it to um, Annette this morning that we operate our program on one key principle. You learn to move and you move to learn. And that's key to everything in life. So it's a key aspect here for me that fundamental movement skills are the alphabet of movement. And for our autistic population, if you do not intervene and provide that alphabet, can we really expect people to have quality movement experiences? So that's key. Number two, the vocabulary of movement is a big component of physical literacy. And physical literacy is not just about moving, but it's about understanding why you move. It's about attaining the benefits of why you move. So there's a lot, a lot to consider when we think about fundamental movements. When we have quality fundamental movement skills, we can see quality participation in physical activity. This has huge health implications for all of us in life. Here today at lunchtime, my wonderful wingman, Tomas, my son, insisted he needed to go home to brush his teeth and have a shower. So I had to dash back to the other campus uh, to drop the man off to do his business and come back again. So thankfully, we're two healthy individuals. I had that move, I have my fundamental movement skills of locomotor down to a fine tea because of Tomas. So I dash back dash over again and didn't feel winded and didn't feel exhausted, etc. And that's the way it should be. Finally, it's key for skill transfer. And I think, Vikram, you mentioned that earlier on. If you have a repertoire of skills in one domain, you can transfer those skills across so many different areas. And that's essential as well. Factors contributing to fundamental movement skills, I think they've been well covered already here. Body growth and maturation, both general and motor learning. And finally, of course, we know that skills need to be learned, practiced and reinforced. The research, I think it has been touched on earlier, but just to say, I suppose, in relation to autism and fundamental movement skills, we know interventions can and do work. We know that the more we practice, the longer the intervention, the better the chance of attaining permanency of skills. And that's really what we would love to see happening for all our population um, over time. Intervention considerations, again, they've been well referenced here today. I suppose for all of us, we would love to see greater numbers involved in research, um, longer uh, studies going on, different types and doses or whatever way you want to word of interventions, that we're looking at different ways and means of delivering. Equally, I think it's wonderful that we've seen the use of technology and we've all heard it referenced here today so positively. And I think that's where STEM and autism is just going to make this so special. And we've seen robotics and so much more um, been used in fundamental movement skills intervention very successfully. We know internationally obesity is a problem for our population. And particularly um, in Ireland, we're beginning to see it becoming an issue as well. And unfortunately, as I am working um, with school teachers and with physiotherapists and OTs, we are now seeing type 2 diabetes in primary school populations in Ireland, which is a great concern. And equally, I would hear people talking of potentially hypertension type issues arising for our younger populations. So we do need to think about the health implications of this. Autism and physical activity, our sedentary um, behaviours for the autistic population are increasing, so we do need to get in and address that as well and, and be, be mindful of it. Um, I suppose then, why then does all this link back? So if we know there is delay and impairment confirmed in our autistic populations, we know that interventions can and do work when we address frequency, intensity and duration of practice. Um, if obesity and physical activity are concerns for us, we need to implement these fundamental movement skill programs as early as possible and consider that principle of learning to move is moving to learn. 
I suppose, too, looking over the literature, there are some common principles that inform all of our program planning around fundamental movement skills. One of those things is allowing time for familiarity. And over time, I would always say to people, if you want somebody to participate in a program, you've got to let them get familiar with the environment, get familiar with the skill. So have a nice video vignette available to show somebody what you want them to do. Um, and show them the environment it will be happening in and potentially who it will be happening with. Last week, we kicked off a whole program of surfing for autistic children um, in County Clare. And that happened because we had a whole series of video vignettes created for the population we were going to be working with before they ever came near the ocean. So they were prepared with the whole familiarization piece. Going back to Evie and Vikram and so many other people's references today, the appropriate communication modality, whatever it is, is appropriate for the person. We should be familiar with it and be using that particular modality. Sensory preferences, we can't get away from them. Every single thing we do on fundamental movement skills, we sensory profile first. Find out where somebody is at. Are they hyper or hypo sensitive to any of the senses? Um, Social skill opportunities, we're not living in isolation. So if we're building fundamental movement skills, we're building them to help people engage, to grow and be part of community. And again, in our own populations in Ireland, we're seeing a lot more community groups, community initiatives, training up in awesome awareness, understanding and acceptance, and making the adaptations to accommodate autistic populations. And that's the way we want to have it. Uh, use of checklists, we use them all the time. We have a look to see where somebody's movement skills are at and maybe it might be tweaking, moving the arms and the next thing somebody is running with a really nice stride and comfortably moving forward. Uh, recording format, you need to get a baseline so you need to record what you're doing. We do descriptive recording, we do reflective frameworks a lot because I love to capture the voice of all stakeholders when we're running programmes. So we tend to use... Um, a reflective approach. Prompt where we needed verbal, visual, whatever is required, reinforce the positive. For us, we see with the emergence of fundamental movement skills, the reinforcer is the participation in the movement itself. Um, incidental teaching and learning. I never miss an opportunity to develop teaching and learning for our population. If we're out running along the road, I'm asking the most, what's that ocean called? What's the registration of the car we're passing? What colour is this? So that there is learning going on all the time. Um, for us, teaching fundamental movement skills, we often teach similar skills together. If we're working on manipulation, we might go for catching, kicking, and throwing together um, because we can set it up as a course and roll around doing the, the skills. Visual schedules, anything that makes learning easier, we use it. So we often use visual schedules to show somebody what's happening. Mobile digital technology, is essential for everything we do. We capture video vignettes all the time because this gives us um, an avenue to revisit our checklist, to look and see exactly where somebody's movement skills are at. Equally, it gives us an avenue for using a speech and language um, point that we can look at the video together and see what's happening, who is in the video, what are they doing. So it opens up other avenues as well. And finally, all of our programs, we consider proprioceptive stretches as key. If you feed the proprioceptors in the world of fundamental movement skills, so much else falls into place. So much else. I was describing a Frequently, I would work with um, autistic participants who pound the ground when they're running. I've had horses run to the walls as we're running past because, again, the proprioceptive need is so great. Somebody is, you know, getting it by really pounding, etc. So the stretches are key. So some of those principles then spilled over into developing our Get Autism Active program. So we have in the program obviously frequency, intensity and duration. We take an eclectic approach. We take what is best of the teaching and learning methodology, validated methodologies out there and we use whatever works for the individual. Um, all of my practice comes very much from an ecological perspective. We're all about addressing the movement skills so we will adapt what we're teaching, we'll adapt the environment, but we are there to accommodate our autistic participants and that's key. 
Uh, we use visual supports, grouping movement categories, as I've said, mobile technologies used, the reflective practice log then is key as well. So whether somebody writes it up longhand or speaks it into the iPhone or records themselves saying how a session went, we use whatever is comfortable for the individual. And finally, incidental teaching and learning are a key component as well. All of our programmes, then the structures, skills are broken down into component parts. We have 21 videos of skills in our Get Autism Active Kit. So each one of those videos come with a checklist with the skills broken down. Each skill is accompanied by a video of an actor demonstrating the skills. We have key voiceover prompts included. We have a sample of incidental teaching and learning points that can be used and the pre and post proprioceptive stretches. The format then for delivery, and you'll see it in a minute, um, we always have a, an autism fundamental support kit available, and I'll talk through that in a minute. Uh, we use our warm-up and our proprioceptive stretches. The participant or participants watch the video of the skill first, then demonstrate the skill. We ask the participant to imitate the skill, we video them doing it, and then they repeat and work on. Um, we tend to start with block practice, catching and throwing a ball, and then move into random practice as the skill emerges. And what this is about is to give somebody the confidence and competence to drive on and develop their self-efficacy themselves. Um, we use our recorded video, as I said, to refine the skills. Very often when you're working with the autistic population, you haven't time to be going through a checklist. You need to be focusing on the individual and the whole movement. So if you can capture a short video vignettes, you can look back on that after and you can rate the scoring, etc. Um, we know with our autistic population, we continue to work on new skills all the time. The Australian Sports Commission talk about developing four new skills per year. Interestingly enough, I started an individual program with a woman who's 22 four weeks ago, and she started doing eight skills at a time herself, and she's shooting through them. So it's just when readiness is there, and in the world of sport and exercise science, we talk about this all the time, you will hit a sweet spot and somebody will drive it on. So it's about give the opportunity and let the person themselves decide how much they want to, to include more skills or not. What is key, I think, and I don't know if I heard, didn't hear it today mentioned, the one thing I noticed that can affect how many skills or how you're teaching skills is whether somebody has also a comorbid diagnosis of learning disability. And certainly we're looking at one third of the population who are autistic having potential learning disability as well. If that is the case, the learning of the skills can be a little different. So it's just something that does have an impact. Um, we generalize, we ask parents to generalize the skills at home. Equally, we link into communities um, groups, whoever, whether it's um, athletics, whether it's swimming, so that these skills are transferred and generalised as they should be in typical community settings. And we build banks of video clips then to establish pro progress. But we also, back in the day when I started out in this world first, we used to collate all those videos and give DVDs to parents every six weeks. And this was a motivational piece, and we have lots of research in the literature that tells us when you have a whole family approach, that will influence how successful a program is or not. So our fundamental support kit, our Autism FMS kit, we tend to have in it, it's just a gear bag, people collect this up themselves, a timeout mat, so if somebody needs to take time out, they can indicate it and sit off from the session, a set of light weights, that's for giving proprioceptive feedback to the upper body, the thorax, if I'm feeling a little bit dysregulated. Uh, TheraBand recoil rope for the same purpose. I might put it around my feet and just pull up from my feet to get that proprioceptive piece going. Mobile digital device available to record our videos. Uh, ball, again, feedback from hopping a ball, that lovely proprioceptive piece. There are teachers all over the country now having balls under the desks that kids are taking out and just bouncing a ball to get regulated in a nice movement break. So simple. Skipping rope, you might think to yourself, are we getting people to skip and hop? And we are, absolutely. But equally, we, we use skipping ropes, just two ropes along a line, and you can decide how narrow or how wide you want to jump when you're jumping, just across two ropes. And finally, 
All of our programmes, we tend to finish up with a fine motor piece of work. So if we're doing, working on three or four fundamental movement skills, we'll put a reflective wall up there, page across the wall, pens, papers, paints available, and people go up and tell us what the session was like by drawing or writing after. So I just really like bringing that gross to fine and that concentrated effort at the end, and then we finish every session with progressive mus muscle relaxation, deep breathing, just getting people back into themselves again. Um, our pre and post proprioceptive stretches, I don't need to explain proprioception to this audience, but I'm just going to show you. Yeah, I was just showing the contrast of working. Um, I was working with Tomas doing the stretches, and then we go to um, Mary demonstrating them as well. So that's in the video as well, just to, to show that contrast. So now we're in. Now just make sure this video works. Um, so here, just to say as well, when we break skills down, we have key identifying features for lots of skills. And here we have the features of catching just broken down. And I suppose it gives an idea of how you can break a skill down and what might be a key component. And if it's missing, will somebody be able to develop their skills appropriately? And I suppose the first thing that we have there is no avoidance reaction. Well, if we're not able to follow the trajectory of a ball, it will be very difficult to learn to catch. So we work on that standing with somebody just holding a ball at the start, sitting on it rolling along the ground, getting comfortable with the object before we think we can start firing it at them. Um, do the eyes follow the ball into somebody's hands? Are the arms held nice and relaxed at the sides and the forearms able to be moved to the front of the body? Um, do the arms give on contact to absorb the force of a ball? Because if they don't, it can be quite painful for somebody. And if you have proprioceptive challenges, that can be huge. Um, do the arms adjust to the flight of the ball if it comes to the left or the right? Um, are the thumbs held in opposition? Um, are the hands, do they grasp the ball in a nice timely motion? And finally, are our fingers grasping effectively? And just gives you an idea as well, the incidental teaching and learning. So just to show the video of that. Keep your eyes on the ball. Reach for the ball. Let the arms give on contact. Keep hands on the sides of the ball. So just to say about that, the videos are designed with an emphasis on the movement, so that Yvonne, our actor, is wearing a plain grey tracksuit on a plain white background, so all you will track is the movement, as opposed to watching whether she's a red dress or big ears or Mickey Mouse on the screen. Um, now, here we go. Um, all of our program planning, I said we learn to move, we move to learn, but equally we learn to reflect, we reflect to learn. And because I work an awful lot, I guess, with educators and um, OTs, physios and that, we really like people to plan programs appropriately, to look and see what is it about the um, experience of the weekly program, to break down what worked well, what didn't, and if it didn't, why didn't it, and what will you change for the next day. Um, how will you adapt your program to your users' needs, to your participants' specific needs, the environment, the skill, the activity? Um, how will you document each day? Will you write it down? Will you use a video on iPhone and iPad? Will you use photographs? Uh, will you have a spoken reflection? And how will you capture your participants' response? Q&A, drawings, reflective wall, recordings, uh, video. 
So just to have all of that planned. The reflector framework for teaching and learning is very much designed to take us across the three key levels of reflection. We start off and we describe something. I'm here at a conference today. The tables are set around the tables, or the chairs are set around the tables. There's 20 tables in the room, blah, blah, blah. Then I go to the next level. Um, I go from technical descriptive to what's called si sensitizing, or situational, sorry. So I'm here in this environment, and I'm here with my son, Tomas, who happens to be autistic. Is there anything I need to think about that will make it easier for Tomas to be here in this room? We were situated at the table up there, and I knew that actual area would not suit him. We needed to be near to the door if he needed a break time to move out of the room. So that's where you're in the situation where you're situationalizing uh, um, how you're planning a program. And the final thing then is sensitizing. When we step into the shoes of the people whose programs we're working on with them, that we understand, like Evie spoke there with Ian, sat together, they took their turns, there was a lovely exchange and it was really collaborative and respectful. And that's where we want to take people working on our Get Out and Active program and kit, that you are working through the program and reflecting on it and seeing it delivered from the perspective of the person you're supporting. And just, again, we have lots of descriptive and qualitative um, feedback, but we used our effective framework just to gather some thoughts there before this particular um, coming over. So just from Killian, one of our participants um, who's autistic, I understand about healthy posture and position when moving because of this resource. I like the visual aid given to us when doing the activities. I learned about movement for specific actions. I do not have a problem with the resource. I can practice the exercises at home. I wouldn't change anything about it. I don't believe any further support materials would be needed. It's easy to follow. I love when somebody gives you directly what they think. <laughs> uh, Noelle, our teacher again. Um, I suppose in an Irish population, PE was one of our subjects in schools, but it became mandatory as a secondary school subject this year. And we now have a minister for physical education, which is really great. So we have real emphasis moving into the world of movement for our autistic population. So just to say, we're seeing big, huge increase or improvements in that. Tim, our parent, once again, the parent of autistic twins, and he's just really blown away with the whole thing, pre-service teacher Yvonne, and that's Vera, our autistic um, participant, saying how wonderful she's getting on with the program, and Kieran, the coach. So I'm just bringing this to the end because um, I want to show a quick video. Have I time to show it, Liz, that long one? Okay. Uh, just to say key points before I show the video, it is never too late to learn a new skill when it comes to motor skills. Never too late. I have seen people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s learn skills. Frequency, intensity, and duration of practice influence all of our FMS learning, indeed all learning. Consider the accumulation of marginal gains. You might not see it improving today, tomorrow, or the day after, but it is happening. There is, it is being laid down there. All of those practices do count. Out of the blue, somebody will hit the sweet spot. I have never met an autistic child or adult who could not learn, and I'm 26 years in this world. I have never met an autistic child or adult who can't learn. Adaptation in teaching and learning is an extension of good practice. If you're not adapting, it's your business, not the person who's autistic. So you need to look at that. An eclectic approach works best, takes the best of what's out there, and don't be afraid to give it a go. And I'm just going to show you a quick look at this video from the, the West World. I'll need this man here now before I go. We took off from the old head of Kinsale, at the beginning of the Wild Atlantic Way, and we ran all the way along the coast, in and out, up and down to Free Derry Corner in Derry. The distance covered was over three and a half thousand kilometres, actually, because we looped in and out did all the spurs off the Wild Atlantic Way in and out of small villages, towns, coastal headlands, and it was phenomenal. It was one of the most amazing experiences you could possibly imagine. Almost every village or every town had some highlight. The hospitality of the people was phenomenal. Farmers pulled up on the side of the road offering us bread and sandwiches, and it was just really touching the hearts of people that I was running with Tomas, my son, who has severe autism. We were doing what's called tethered running. And our message was 
develop autism awareness and understanding and equally to promote the whole business of autism and movement. Sit. Now here we go. Up the hill. Sit. Well done. Now we're going to turn. I focused my PhD in this area looking at autism and developing basic fundamental movement skills and developing programs to suit children and adults on the spectrum. And of course, it was like lifting the lid of the whole world of autism because it provided a whole avenue for children and adults to develop social skills, to develop language skills, to mix with others without being under pressure, and equally to get this whole piece of self-regulation by being out, moving, building up a sweat, increasing their pulse rate, their heart rate, all those endorphins been released, serotonin been released in the brain, dopamine been released, and you would start out doing a run with somebody feeling rigid, uptight, and by the end of it, they were just letting go, relaxed, breathing in themselves and at one with you and with nature. I see Claire as a real pivotal spot for growing this whole area. And I'm thinking of the Autism Hub of Europe in terms of research, policy and practice. Looking at teaching interventions in the world of autism, looking at the whole area of technology in the world of autism, and also looking at the whole area of engineering in the world of autism. I want to empower people to empower people on the spectrum. I want us to grow together. I want us to believe in each other. Inclusive practice isn't just a dream or an ambition. Inclusive practice is a must in everyday life. My name is Susan Crawford and I am an Autism Spectrum Consultant. I specialise in addressing movement skills for children and adults on the Autism Spectrum. Thank you very much. Take it down. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susan. That was wonderful. Uh, the power of movement is the power of life. Why are we neglecting it? I don't understand. <laughs> Ever understand that.